the worship of the Lord Jesus. It is good to be at a place and in a time where we have set aside, each one of us, to take a moment with each other to honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I know that each of you does that uh, at various times throughout your week, but uh, I'm very appreciative of you for taking that time to be together this day. Take a moment uh, at some point to contemplate those around you, to lift them up in prayer, to consider the effect they've had on your life, to consider the blessing that worshiping with them over the years, or perhaps even hours, uh, has meant to you, and to contemplate what uh, the future might be in uh, as you worship together, as you serve together. I want to thank Roger and Ann once again for heading up our uh, food pantry activity that we had yesterday. Um, a, uh, um, a wonderful event. Uh, I want to atone a little bit for last week. Uh, Sheila had given me an announcement to give, and I completely forgot it, so I'm going to do it now. And is it in the bulletin, by the way? It is in the bulletin, too. So that is coming up September 24th, which is a week from today. So in your What's Coming Up section of the bulletin, well, we don't have it there in the What's Coming Up, but we do have it in the special announcements. Uh, special announcement two, the women's department will host a wedding shower for Crosby Saxon, who's Gail Peavy's granddaughter, uh, this coming Sunday now, a week from today, at 3 p.m. in the uh, fellowship room, just back behind us there. It is for the ladies, so take notice of that. In, in, uh, we're looking at uh, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, roughly. Uh, but definitely the three o'clock part's not rough, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, on uh, other good news sorts of items, what do you got? Got some good news? Charlie, you got some good news for us? Anything going on that's pretty pretty good deal? Okay, that's fair. Just uh, make sure you gave a chance. Mitch, good news? No? Okay, good. Uh, anybody else? Ma yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm glad you said that because I just saw it here. I said, I better say that, and then I forgot about it. Uh, that is special announcement one, which is, and it's also what's coming up, number one, 6.30 to 8.30, uh, excuse me, 6.30 to 8, football family night. And I have a feeling that Wayne, who um, it will be in charge of this, is not here today because of a certain football game that went on yesterday about which I am still not over. Uh, but I suppose it, when you get beat pretty bad, uh, at least your, your heart is still in pretty good shape because there wasn't any tension or drama to it at all. All right, enough about that. I will be wearing my purple and gold Wednesday, but I will be in humble, uh, humble position for sure head hung and all that. Okay, this coming Wednesday. So the idea is you wear the colors of your favorite team and uh, I suppose uh, we think in terms of where you may have gone to college, but it doesn't have to be. So if any of you Bama fans just happen to want to wear an Auburn shirt, I'm sure that's quite all right. Nobody's going to worry with that. Uh, make sure I'm not being attacked at all. Glad Larry's not here to, sit, to hear that. Uh, yes? Yes, decorations are invited. Coffee mugs, maybe a uh, bobblehead. And why would you? That's a very odd decoration. What are you talking about? Uh, okay, an elephant, maybe a, uh, a tiger uh, of some sort. 
An eagle? Sure. Uh, a hornet, perhaps, or a, a bulldog, uh, something along. Yes. Chili dogs with chips and drinks. And uh, so be ready for that, too. Uh, please no live elephants, though. I do ask for that. Or tigers. Uh, or eagles. Yes, Roger. I just, I just received uh, permission to announce that um, I'm going to do the number. Excellent. Roger has announced that he has just received permission to tell us and to make it public that Daniel has been called to the office of elder. And do we have yet a date of ordination planned out? got some classwork to do, so we don't have a date yet, but he will be welcome to have it here if he sure. happens to want that. Uh, not that he might want to have it where he's being employed, but you know, just in case. <laughs> Excellent. That is good news. And uh, birthdays, something along that line, uh, good newsy? Anything? No? Okay. We'll, we know we'll be having some come not too long. Uh, you do? Thursday. Uh, and our firstborn's birthday was yesterday, and my grandson's birthday, and my sister's birthday on Monday. So we've got a lot of family birthdays. Fantastic. Uh, Jerry birthday and birthdays. Jean? Sonny. Sonny. Twenty second. Uh, don't you live in denial? Johnette? Avery, Avery 9 on Friday. Johnette's granddaughter. How sweet. Uh, let's sing happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Let us continue with our worship. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you to this service on this beautiful day. And I hope that during this service on Heritage Day, we remember those who have built what we know and love here, physically and most importantly, spiritually, including all of the past historical sites, and those who have come before us and are still among us watching over us. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name.
Our dear Heavenly Father, a group of your people have met in this place today to worship you, to feel your sweet, forgiving spirit, and, be, and let us all be renewed in our faith. We thank you for the opportunities you've given us to meet together. Thank you for the opportunity to know each other, to love each other, and to be concerned for one another. It's our prayer today, dear God, that needs will be met, forgiveness felt where there's need, and your Holy Spirit be with us as we worship together. We pray for our speaker today, dear Lord. Give him the message you want him to deliver to your people. For we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus our Christ. Amen. Two things I'd like for you to do at this time. One, think of somebody that you know has a need. And two, think of a need that you have that you want to put forth on this altar at this time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please grant us peace of mind and calm our troubled hearts. Our souls are like a turbulent sea at times. We can't seem to find our balance, so we stumble and worry constantly. Give us the strength and the clarity of mind to find our purpose and walk the path you had laid out before us. We trust your love, God, and know that you will heal this stress that we have. Just as the sun rises each day against the dark of night, please bring us clarity of our search for peace with the light of Jesus. Encompass it with the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The author of the hymn we are about to sing, William Fowler, was born in Australia in 1830, the son of a British soldier and his wife. Within a few years of the family's return to England, both his parents died, leaving William an orphan at the age of 14. In the winter of 1848, he became dissatisfied with his parents' Methodist religion and accepted the invitation of a friend to attend the Latter-day Saint Church in Sheffield, England. The next summer, he was baptized. He was ordained a priest the following year and an elder in 1851. Although we do not know the exact circumstances of the writing of this hymn, it was probably written before 1863, when Fowler and his family sailed for America. He died only two years later, having left to the Latter-day Saint movement a grand hymn traditionally sung to express appreciation for prophetic leadership in our day. In Community of Christ Sings, the text has been updated to reflect the expanding role of a prophetic people within the church and throughout the globe.
Ella DeVore and her husband, L.R., arrived in French Polynesia in 1891 as missionaries. It didn't take them long to see transportation as crucial to spreading the gospel of Christ in the South Pacific. Unfortunately, the church did not own a boat. The two prayed earnestly for an answer to their problem. Then one day they heard the words, Write and make your wants known through the home column. The mother's home column was a regular feature in the Saints' Herald, begun by Marietta Walker in 1886. The home column gave counsel, encouraged healthy diets and clean homes, and invited discussion on all church issues. It was quite popular even among men. The divorce followed the guidance of the Spirit and sent a letter to the mother's home column. Marietta Walker responded by pleading with her readers to support the construction of the Van Elia, a missionary boat. Women were encouraged to make donations on their birthdays, one penny for each year. Walker also co-authored a book of poetry and donated all proceeds to the Van Elia. Within two years, enough funds were raised to build the Christian, the gospel boat. The Evangelia was just one of many missionary endeavors supported by Mother's Home Column readers. Will the ushers come forward? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please bless these offerings so they may help in the building of your kingdom. Amen. On our bulletin in the front, you can see what I do with my hair. You can see the notation under the scripture, Heritage Day. Now I want to ask the kids in our group, so that's high school to newborn, whatever. Uh, what's heritage mean? You don't have to feel like you can you have to give a thorough, complete definition. But can you throw me a few words that you associate with heritage? Matthew, any words? Okay, fine. Yeah, if you, if you want to pass, fine. Uh, don't have to. Mitch, anything, any words you can throw at me that you associate with heritage? Old. Okay. <laughs> See, now, I did not plan this out ahead of time. I'm not trying to. Okay, that's, that's pure, very good, old, and fair, that's fair, that's fair. Uh, Hannah, any words that, when I say the word heritage, do you think of any description or other words? If not, that's fine. 
Grandparents. Okay, that is a very nice and respectful, wonderful way of saying old. <laughs> Lovely. And uh, tell us who's sitting by you, Hannah. Eva? Eva, do you have any words that you associate with heritage? If not, just say pass, whatever. Pass, fine, good. Pass, well, okay. John said that, not me. That pass was a good one. Um, past, certainly. Now, probably <laughs> the, those words sum up a, a great majority of what we might consider to be our heritage. Now, we do in this particular church, this, not, this denomination, yes, but also this particular congregation, have, uh, to me, an interesting heritage. And I'll... Um, and what's the saying? Those who uh, forget history are bound to repeat its mistakes. I don't. Who said that? Anybody know? I don't know who said that. It's a great saying. Santiana. Who? Santiana. Santiana. Who is he? <laughs> Philosopher. Okay. Uh, awesome. That uh, and it, I think it holds true. Now, uh, how much of the History we want to keep in mind uh, is perhaps up for question, but a little trivia here, a little history trivia for you. Anybody can answer, and I do want answers. How many charter members were there when this particular denomination, Community of Christ, Restoration, uh, got its first start? Sonny? Six. Can you name them? I can't, but can you? Don't have to. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, six of them. Uh, what was the date, somebody else besides Sonny, what was the date that they, these six guys, and they were all guys, uh, got together and started this church? What was that date? And what else? April 6, 1830. Excellent. Um, here's one for you. Chronologically... Chronologically, what is the first section in the book we call the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a book of, uh, we just sang about prophets. It's a book in which we compiled the writings of our prophets that have been presented as revelations. Chronologically, what is the first section? Section 2. Okay, section 1 is not chronologically the first section. Very, very fun. See, we're having fun. Uh, the forerunner to the Book of Doctrine and Covenants was called something else, a former compilation of revelatory statements by our prophet. Just had one at the time. Matthew, Book of Commandments. Awesome, that's great. Matthew's up on our heritage. Terrific. Uh, can anyone here... Off the top of their head, not with, by looking, not by looking, can you name all the books of the Bible in order, start to finish? And we'll take uh, as long as it takes for it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I can't either. I, I was working on that once and then got distracted and you know, quit. But uh, all right, how many books are there in the Bible? That's a trick question. How many books are there in the Bible? Too many. Now, come on, Lemoyne, you're not playing right. All right, oh, yes, Dorothy. 300. Well, that is, um, <clears throat> that is close, I'll put it that way. Uh, uh, not quite so many. 66, if you're talking about the King James Version. More than 66, if you're talking about the Catholic Version. 65, if you're talking about the Inspired Version. Okay, that's, see, a lot of fun trivia here. Uh, can anyone name the books of the Book of Mormon in order? Start to end. There's not so many, only 15 of those. Okay, that's your assignment. You can remember 15. No, I'm just kidding. All right, the highest numbered section right now, the highest numbered section of the Doctrine and Covenants. John, I heard you say something. 165. 165? Is that right? It is. Okay, we have confirmation. 165. Very good. Uh, 
How many, we sang about prophets, how many prophets have we had, including the current one, in the community of Christ? I hear seven, seven, two, I hear eight, 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 give me, who give me eight, who give me eight, I have seven, who give me eight, there is eight, eight sold, eight, we got eight, uh, eight, all right, city and state of our church headquarters, Matthew, talk to your guy, ask him. Independence, Missouri, way to go, Matthew, Burning it up. That's awesome. Independence, Missouri. How many apostles do we have now? Versus how many, how many apostles are, are, are allowed for in our scripture and law? How many, how many apostles are we allowed for? Yes. Is it Evie? Eve? Eva. Twelve. You got it. I don't think we got twelve right now. We're missing a couple. But... Uh, uh, I didn't look up exactly how many, but 12, yes, thank you, very good. Um, back to that April 6, 1830, what was the city and state in which the church was started when those six guys got together and did their thing? What city and state? Matthew. Say it again. Fayette, New York, yes. I, I agree. He did. I think he did mean that. That's right. Fayette, New York. Super. Okay. What was the first name of the church that, as it was incorporated? Matt, I can see. Uh, all right. Did I hear somebody over here? Hold on. I'll get to you. Church of Jesus Christ. Church of Jesus Christ. Is that what you were going to say, Matthew? Church of Jesus Christ. Or uh, actually, it's Church of Christ. That was it. Church of Christ. Yeah. That's what he meant. And I knew it. I could. Yeah. Uh, well, and you know, that, that's pretty close. Uh, anyone recall what the next name is the church had? It was Church of the Latter Day Saints, and then it was Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and then on and on. So, uh, goodness, if we're going to follow our heritage, we're about time to change our name again. We, we've had a lot of uh, name changes. Okay. Um, we got a hymn in our hymn book that was sung at the Kirtland Temple dedication. I don't know, but I think it may be the oldest hymn in our hymn book that was written by someone part of our church. Anyone know which number that is in the current hymn book? What hymn? Now, it's... It's been changed a little bit from Kirtland Temple days. Uh, a song that was actually sung by our, not just our grandfathers and mothers, but greats and greats and greats and greats, a bunch of greats. Back in 1836 it was. Uh, I, I thought I heard it. 384. Matthew, he just beat you to it, just barely. 384 is it. So the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. That is, uh, continues it. All right, yeah, we got, we got a, a, a cheering section in the back for the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. Awesome. And that's part of our heritage, and it has, it continues to be a favorite song of ours, and yet it is very old, very uh, heritage-y, heritage-y. Um, all right, excellent. Um, all right, here's one that I that I thought was interesting. What is the first section in the Doctrine and Covenants that was given after, on or after the church was actually started? Section 19. We had uh, 18 of those things. Well, actually, section 1 probably came after the church was started. We have, uh, see, 2 to 18 is uh, 17. 17 sections that actually came to us prior to the church actually being started. All right, that's fun stuff. All right, uh, here's one. Three, three historical heritage-like buildings in Independence, Missouri, where our headquarters is. Three of them that have to do with our church headquarters, either past or present. Can we name those three? Three buildings. Three. Got the Stone Church, 
which was where we had our world conferences before <clears throat> was built. Uh, Mary, auditorium, and Matthew, temple. There you go, three buildings clustered around the, uh, these, the temple property in Independence and part of our uh, World Church uh, headquarters complex. Sweet, okay. I had some others there, but I'm gonna pass them up because you can have too much fun and we just don't want to have that. Uh, there's, there's other heritage, there are other heritage issues and we see in the scriptures how some of those who have gone before us have handled these situations, how forgetting has hurt them on occasion and how remembering has helped. I want to direct your attention to Moses and uh, another little trivia aspect. Did Moses come before Jesus or after Jesus? Anybody got a recollection of that? Was Moses before Jesus came to the earth or after? That was kind of a trick question. I'll say it again. Was Moses before Jesus came to the earth or after? We have, yes, Eve, Eve, Eva, I mean. After, do we have another guess? <laughs> now, technically, the way I first asked it, she is correct. If Jesus was always without beginning of days uh, or end of years, then yes, Jesus was before Moses. But coming to the earth was after. Now, what about Abraham? Was, Ab was Moses after Abraham or before Abraham in his appearance on the earth? Any takers on that one? Moses. He was after, after Abraham, quite a bit after Abraham. Uh, okay, more fun. Uh, Moses was a, if you think about it, you, you can get almost a feel for him a little bit in terms of loneliness. If you recall the story, uh, Pharaoh, the chief executive officer of Egypt at the time, declared that the Israelites, who had been originally there as a manner of solving a very important uh, national crisis, namely famine, and we know that Joseph, the son of Israel, was chief, essentially uh, prime minister of Egypt to execute a plan to deal with this famine, worked out great, but over the years, the Egyptians uh, became somewhat fearful of these strangers and these uh, immigrants, or however you want to put them. And a uh, law was passed that the children, I believe the boys, the boys should be killed, the little baby boys. Well, Moses' mother, uh, being a good mother, wanted to avoid this, but she knew the, the way to do this the only way she knew how was to actually disclaim any attachment to Moses. Her beautiful baby boy, she had to give up. And so just put him in a basket to float down the river. She kept an eye on him from a distance and noticed that the Pharaoh's daughter picked the baby up and had such compassion. She wanted to choose the baby or uh, take the baby as her own. But being a very important uh, royal, she didn't really have time to actually take care of it. So she wanted someone to help her raise this baby. And Moses' mother just happened to show up and say, I'll be glad to help out. So Moses did get to be raised by his mother. We don't know, I'm, I don't know whether Moses ever knew that that's who was raising him. Uh, but he was raised as an Egyptian, even though he was of Hebrew descent. He was an Israelite. So Moses had a heritage that I'm sure his mother uh, delivered to him in one way or another. In fact, uh, Wayne Ham, who used to be an official of our church, and I'm thinking back in the 1970s now when uh, I was in a uh, class that he was teaching, and he pointed out that if a Jew, if a person uh, has parents, one who is a Jew and one who is not, he can be considered a Jew if his mother is the uh, Jewish person. 
If his father is, but his mother is not, he may not be considered a Jew. And so where this came from, I'm not sure, perhaps this instance, but uh, we see that Moses did undoubtedly receive of the heritage of his people. And he also, by at least by osmosis, certainly picked up, that was a joke, wasn't it? Osmosis, Moses, I don't know. Uh, he, he certainly picked up, at least by being around the Egyptian court, the heritage not only of the Egyptians, but of the royal family. And understood quite a bit about what, how that worked. So we can see that perhaps God selected Moses to free the children of Israel because of his unique background. We don't have any clue otherwise as to why God selected him, not from the scriptural record. But Moses certainly had a heritage that crossed the boundary between those he was to free and those who were keeping his people in bondage. We see, though, that Moses may not have quite had everything together. One uh, episode in the second, or excuse me, the third chapter of Exodus. Um, it is the second, I'm sorry. He uh, saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew and uh, solved that problem by killing the Egyptian. In fact, the scripture says he looked left, he looked right. He didn't want to get caught for this thing and uh, tried to make it a secret, and in fact, the scripture says he buried the body in the sand. Sounds almost like some of the uh, uh, CSI episodes we read today, how people try to get away with murder, literally. Uh, then, not long after that, Moses sees two Hebrews fighting with each other. Uh, the scripture says that uh, he went to the one who was in the wrong, so evidently he had watched this escalation take place from some vantage point. And he went to the one who did wrong and said, why are you doing this? And the, uh, the, the both of them say, who are you to, to come and uh, legislate between us? You gonna kill somebody like you did that other guy? See, Moses thought he hadn't seen it, uh, that nobody had seen him. Now he got scared and come to find out it was known and and the, the word got out. And folks, let me tell you, this was before Twitter. So still the word traveled fast. Pharaoh learned about it. Pharaoh's going to do a little justice on Moses. And Moses got wind of that. Actually, he didn't get wind of it. He just figured what was going to happen. He realized that if these guys knew, probably everybody knew. So he got out of there, fled, went to... Uh, the land called Midian. Now, I don't, I don't know much about all the histories and the peoples and so forth. I suspect these were not Hebrew people. They were not even Egyptians. They were a tribe of some sort. And Moses went there to seek refuge. Why there, I don't know. But uh, what's one of the first things he happened? He, he got into a little row, got into a fight. He uh, was going by the well, the uh, children of uh, Jethro, his future father-in-law, uh, didn't know it at the time, but that's who it was, the, not the, the children, the daughters, were there to try to draw water, feed the flocks, and the shepherds ran them off. Now, I suspect these might be opposing shepherds. This sort of thing actually happened, uh, I believe, to Abraham. He had a little shepherd set to himself and had to run them off. And... Uh, so Moses, we find out, had a bit of violence in his heritage, uh, his own personal heritage. Uh, makes it tough for us to agree with God that he ought to be the one to lead his people. In fact, I wonder, uh, reading back on this episode, if that may be why he asked Aaron, or why he asked God not to have him speak because language may have been hard for Moses to the point that he got frustrated, angry, and was not mature enough yet to know how to deal with that besides fisticuffs, to use an old word for you there, Mitch, fisticuffs. 
So uh, as we know, God in the scripture, God got mad at Moses for questioning uh, God's ability to work with about anybody. But he did relent and gave him Aaron. So I wonder if Moses was not begging out of fear, stage fright, or anything of that nature, but out of some realization of where his limitations really hit hard. And we can see today there are people who have trouble communicating with words and often resort to violence because of frustration, because it just, it's just not working for them. And what a sad and, and lonely place that must be to have to deal with those frustrations. Well, this isn't the end of the problems because Moses uh, gets to marry Zipporah, one of Jethro's daughters. Uh, they live happy, happily ever after, not quite. Uh, we have more goings on. Uh, Moses has the burning bush experience. He has the uh, experience of God telling him to go back. Everybody's dead over there. He's trying to you know, settle up for this little killing thing you did. And uh, now it's time to go free your people. And God prepared him with, uh, do, do we remember, God, God gave Moses a few tools to use in his arguments of dealing with the Egyptians. Notice these were physical things. These were not conversational. Again, Moses, if he had a problem with communicating verbally, this uh, was God's help to him to allow him to use visual symbols. What was one of them? Anybody recall? Sonny? A staff, which uh, Moses was able to do a pretty neat trick that Matthew would have been as good as any video game you can come up with, okay? Video games in Exodus. What, what did that stick do when Moses threw it on the ground? Turned into a serpent. Turned into a serpent. And uh, what happened when he picked it up? Yes, Eve, Evie, Eva, sorry. Back into a staff. Serpent, staff, serpent, staff. Anything else uh, you can recall that, that he got to help him communicate God's intents? His hand, right? Stuck it in there. I don't have a jacket, but, you know, stuck it in there next to his skin. Comes out leprous. Stuck it back in, comes out clean. In leprous, in clean. Cool. You don't see that in a video game. Uh-uh. Probably no leprosy in any video games. Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, okay, and so uh, he had a third thing. He could take a cup of water. Um, I'm thinking it was the Nile, but it may have been any place. Pour it on the ground, turn into blood. None of these were verbal. They were all visual. And Aaron did the verbal part. Perhaps Aaron was a little more uh, diplomatic and a little more in control of his emotions. I, I, don't, I don't know. But we suspect there was real life going on even back then, even in our heritage times. We also see, uh, before Moses gets to Israel, another episode of heritage, and that is in Exodus 4, chapter 20 through 26. Uh, I said four chapter, I meant four verse 20 through 26. The, uh, as we know, Moses married a non-Hebrew wife. In fact, think about it, Joseph uh, married a non-Hebrew wife. Joseph, the son of Israel, uh, one of the greatest figures in the Bible, did not have a quote-unquote uh, proper wife. Uh, if you will, for the Hebrews. So his sons were not fully Hebrew, if you think of that, Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, but Zipporah was not knowledgeable of Moses' heritage, certainly not his church heritage, if you will. Uh, Moses and his family all take off to Egypt. Oops, we forgot. You're supposed to circumcise the boys at eight days old. Moses hadn't done that. So uh, the scripture says, in fact, God came after him. 
the uh, a note in the Living Bible, which is a New International Version translation, uh, notes that the, the words could also be translated as God coming after Moses' son. Do we recall in Moses' heritage when there was another case where a son of a called being, a called man in this case, was, his life was at risk because of the covenant. Can we recall in Moses' heritage? Who, was, who went back there almost lost his son because of a covenant? Abraham. Abraham. Little different circumstance, but Abraham. The, the record tells us that Abraham was about to slay his son as a sacrifice, and God called that up. We now see that because Moses had not carried through on the covenant requirement of circumcision, somebody was about to get it. Now this puts God in somewhat of a bad light, but let's think about what, how God feels about details. Billy can tell you about a few details. That was his life's work for, uh, amongst other things, to prepare details of structural steel connections. Because if you don't tend to the details, something bad is going to happen. God demanded that his covenant people fulfill the covenant. God doesn't just go along to get along. We should, of all things, in reading the scriptures, come to that conclusion. God does not go along just to get along. One of my favorite themes of our book of scripture, the Book of Mormon, is the theme of ripening, where God's long-suffering and his redemptive nature allows for each of us to stumble, and we do. But at some point, when the iniquity, as the scripture says, becomes ripe, then the harvest will be demanded. And there will be a time where God will have to take action to eliminate the iniquity. But not after long suffering. It, it was pointed out to me one time that uh, we all know who, who is, and according to the Bible record, who is the longest lived person in the Bible, in the world? Who lived the longest? Methuselah. Methuselah. God said to Noah he would not bring the flood until Methuselah died. That's long-suffering. God was going to put it off as long as he could, and until the oldest guy passed away, he was going to try every means possible to redeem these people, to allow them to make a choice. Only then was the iniquity ripened. Only then did God take action. So we learn that Moses was not God's homie. God did not see Moses as always oh, some equal guy. God was God, and Moses needed to obey. And each of us needs to do that in our own life. Whether we consider the sacraments of baptism, which fortunately is since the Lord, coming of the Lord is our method of becoming a covenant person as opposed to circumcision, whether it be communion, the taking of the blood and body, the symbols of the blood and body of Jesus. These things we must do in response. They are not hard. They are not complicated. They are required. They are part of God's desire for covenant and his rules for covenant. So it took Zipporah, Moses' unheritaged wife, if you will, to somehow remember, recall, oh yeah, I think I remember something about this, and take matters into her own hands and make sure her sons were circumcised. The inspired version reads interestingly, different from the King James in this episode, in that the inspired version testifies that Moses was sorrowful for having made this omission. And he understood that he was out of step, out of line. 
And this is good for us to do. And this comes to the theme of today also on the bulletin, forgive each other. For a dynamic of forgiveness is to be redemptive. Uh, forgiveness is tough. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, and so I'm not going to say much about it because I don't think I could enlighten you a whole lot. I've done it some, a few times, and people have done it to me. It's been wonderful, but let's think about kind of the, the whole boundary within which forgiveness exists, and that is there must be some redemption. Redemption requires that there be a stark and truthful and realistic and enlightened examination of feelings and of events and of ramifications and of something new. That appears in the Old Testament a lot. God is going to do something new. And that's what his forgiveness is about. That there is some, it's not just, oh, whew, I got off free from that. No, it's about something new going to happen and there has to be some redemptive moving in a different direction, a forward direction, something of that nature. So we see that after Zipporah circumcised her and Moses' children, we don't see God maintaining a grudge. I am going to find a way to get that Moses. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. No, we don't find that. We find now God is, is on to the next step. Let's, let's do a little redemption here. Let's move forward. Let's get this thing going in a different and proper direction. We look at many passages in the scripture as referring to God as the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. That's part of our heritage. That's a heritage statement. And I've often wondered, why, why do we stop there? I mean, it's three, and we always like threes. But what about Joseph? I mean, if it weren't for Joseph, uh, Jacob would have died prematurely. They wouldn't have been able to probably uh, sustain their, their lineage, the tribes of Israel and all that. Why not Joseph? Think, though, to remember God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, uh, Jacob, excuse me, is to remember God as the God of freedom. When, these, when the Hebrews were free, when they were not under bondage, and when they were in their place, in their lands, physically their lands. This is the God we look for, the God to deliver us from bondage, to restore us to freedom, to bring us home. The God of Joseph would be correct, but it would have us think in terms of the time of bondage, the time of uh, perhaps being getting a little sloppy with the uh, ordinances and the sacraments, the covenants. Now, that's a very harsh sounding word. Think of yourself if you were in that kind of bondage. Just how easy would it be to keep up with some, anything that we might call normal? Tough, hard, but nevertheless, it could not be the way that God's kingdom, his Zion, would be built. We must look at God as a God of freedom, of the land of our home, spiritually and literally. Let us then contemplate our heritage, one which is rich, one which has been paid for by many, many, many Many people before us, people that were of different nations, whole different ways of thinking, people that uh, had great limitations in how they traveled or how they communicated or how they were able to live their life. Because of them, we have a rich record and history of their interaction with God. And inasmuch as they responded to God, and thought to write it down, we have a great library and catalog of interactions. And these should be valued. 
and studied. Even Jesus himself took great pains to understand his scripture, to understand what it meant to be Hebrew, to be Jewish, even at a young age, 12. Any, uh, let's see, Hannah, you're 10. Eva, how old are you, if I may ask? 10 also. You're getting close to that time when Jesus talked with old folks and learned many things, even challenged them on many things. And I will report to you that my, perhaps my most pure, greatest, exciting spiritual experience that I've ever had in my life, I was 13 years old. There's something about that age of beginning to develop faculties in your mind, understanding, and curiosity about what is God all about. It is a time to know your heritage and to learn it even at that young age. Let us continue then to hear that voice of the Spirit speaking from primordial days through all time to now, that we may learn truth and joy and peace. Tim spoke a good word with us today. As we leave, we need to think of things that our heritage, our history. It's, it's something that we learn from. Where are we going to? It's kind of the unknown. But let's face it, folks, there's an attack on Christianity throughout the world. We look around and we see that the, the defacing of crosses throughout the world, our beautiful country here, the uproar and upheaval that's going on, the burning of our flag here, which is a symbol of our freedom. We need to take these things to heart as we leave. True, we need to forgive each other. Sometimes it's real hard. But we need to understand that we are a blessed nation here. We're a free nation. We have the ability to make mistakes. We have the ability to triumph over those mistakes as well. So we need to reach out to each other, the ones that are hurting, in the streets, in the churches. We need to keep our government, we need to keep our government in our prayers. We need to pray for our congressman, our senator. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray that the actions that they have will affect not just us, but the world, to help make the world a better place. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.